Hi again. Next uh, session is a key session, and uh, it's with an uh, online Scott Hunter, hopefully. So, Scott, do you are you with us out there? I am with you. Perfect. A little loud here, but uh, I guess we can handle that. <laughs> so, please uh, welcome Scott Hunter from uh, Microsoft. Thank you so much. So, uh, as I as I said, I am I, I'm Scott Hunter. Um, I'm the VP of product at Microsoft on uh, the Azure DevX team, and I've been working on .NET for basically my entire career. Um, super excited about uh, .NET 6, which we just shipped in November. Uh, the, to kick off, I'll actually say we're going to talk a little bit about .NET 6, and then I'm going to show you some ideas and concepts that we're thinking about in .NET 7. And some of those concepts are actually available today uh, in Preview 5. Um, but our, some of our big goals was when we started the .NET Core project years ago, um, we we had a .NET Core uh, BSL based base class libraries. We had a .NET Framework based class libraries, and we had a, a Xamarin based class libraries. With .NET 6, we've unified all those into a single single uh, base class library. That means you're using the exact same code no matter what platform you're on. Uh, obviously, we lead with performance. That's why .NET is here. And uh, uh, the other goal is to make it easier get get started. That, that was a big push in .NET 6. We've got some great new features. Uh, C sharp 10 and F sharp ships releases, and I know Maz Torgerson is in, is in, in uh, at the conference and is going to talk to these tomorrow, I believe. We've added Apple uh, M1 support, and this is a long term release. It's got three years of support. Um, I mentioned before, we've actually, for the first time ever since we started this new .NET Core journey, we've got to, got us to a place where all the workloads run on .NET 6. We mobile was the last missing piece. It comes with .NET Maui. And everything runs on the exact same base class libraries using the same runtime components, compilers, and languages. Um, you know, people always ask, how are we doing? Uh, we have 5.6 million .NET developers uh, using Visual Studio. That's the only way we can see count you. Um, and we're growing at around a 10% annual rate, which I'm very happy about. We've been the most loved framework in the Stack Overflow's developer survey for three years in a row. Um, and uh, the Cloud Native Foundation keeps tracks of the highest velocity OSS projects. And .NET is consistently in the top 10. It was actually the number one project right before .NET 6 uh, RTM. And we only open sourced this in 2014, so we've made a huge uh, uh, gain there. If you think about .NET 6, um, we've already had more people move from uh, 5 to 6 than we had people move from 3 to 5. Uh, so it's the fastest adopted version of .NET ever. Um, 6.9 contributors out in the community have their code inside of .NET. 21,000 uh, contributions from those 6.9K. So I just want to say thank you to the .NET community for helping uh, make a great product. Um, you know, you know this. This is something I've been talking about for years, which is we want to lead with performance. So uh, you can still see that we're way faster than Node.js um, in case like seven times faster, uh, three times faster than Java. And I'm really excited that uh, in .NET 6, we, we had a huge performance improvement in EF Core. Uh, you can see it's almost doubled in performance, and it's actually as fast almost as Dapper, which is Stack Overflow's very lightweight uh, ORM. Of course, with the new .NET comes a new Visual Studio. Uh, the things that I think about here that are really cool in Visual Studio 2022 is it's 64 bits, so it can load large projects uh, into memory. It's got great support for um, CI CD publishes with .NET, and it's got hot reload support, which is probably the, the, the most important feature we needed to add to uh, uh, to .NET in this cycle. Um, and of course, I, this is actually wrong now. I should fix this slide. Um, it's going to bother me here, so I'll just do this. Um, uh, we have GA'd a Visual Studio for Mac uh, 2022. It's been rewritten, uh, so all the UI is now native Mac UI. Um, it also, uh, there's a preview build of it as well that now supports Maui, uh, but it's basically super fast now. It's got modern Mac UI in it. It's got support for .NET 6. And if you download the preview builds of that, you get support for Maui as well. Um, we ship a something called the .NET upgrade system. We still have lots of customers uh, running on .NET framework, and we want to make it easy for them to move those code bases forward. So this is a tool you can grab. It'll convert your project files. It'll fix your references. It'll even fix some of the code in those things. It's great for moving a, um, an MVC application or uh, uh, any desktop applications really, really, really move easy. Uh, and you can just grab it right at this uh, uh, URL at the bottom. And then, of course, 
what, what were our goals and themes in .NET 6? There was three. One was simplified development. The next was cloud development. And the third one was modern client uh, development. Those are the three main, main pillars uh, that we did in .NET 6. And so for simplified development, um, what we've done is you have one CLI. The CLI can now build mobile, web, desktop, all the workloads. Um, you've got hot reload uh, from the command line as well. Um, and you've got native support for ARM, and you can still build single legacies as well. That's been something we had since uh, about .NET 3. Um, hot reload. This is my favorite feature probably in, in .NET 6 all up, which is um, it used to be that you would run your application, see what was wrong with it, close it, go make a code change, and rerun it again. You never have to do that again. Now what you do is you start running your application. You don't even have to use the debugger. You can just actually do a, a control F5, which runs without the debugger. And as you start making code changes, they'll just appear live in the project. Um, there are some limitations, and if you hit any of those, please email us or please ping us on Twitter, and uh, we will try to get those fixed in .NET 7. But it supports all project types, including .NET Framework, um, and it's available in the CLI and Visual Studio 2022. So this means that you know, you're working on a Blazor application, you just make a code change, your browser refreshes. You don't have to stop and start and stop and start. It's going to save you tons of time. Um, next one, which Maz is going to talk about in, in detail tomorrow, uh, some amazing features in C Sharp 10. And my favorite is, you know, you look at every .NET project and every file's got using system, using this, using that at the very top. Uh, we have a new feature called global usings, uh, where you can define a, a using and globally, so it doesn't have to be at, put at the top of every single file. Um, we have implicit usings for project types as well. This means that if you build an ASP.NET project, will automatically include the ASP.NET um, usings for you by default. You can turn that off if you want. It's in the project file. Um, we've made namespaces. Uh, there'd normally be a, a curly brace there to indent the whole file over to make it cleaner. No need for that anymore. You just put a semicolon and, and you get file, space, file, spaced, uh, uh, file scope namespaces. Uh, we had um, records. Now we let you do structs as well, the same way that you build records. And, and this, this Example doesn't do it justice, but my favorite feature in C Sharp is going to be notice that this is, I just want to get a string uh, from a Lambda. Uh, it used to be that you would have to do a funk where you basically told us that we needed a string and an int uh, to do this, and that typecast is now gone. And this one, that's what makes the simplified development with, with uh, minimal uh, web APIs possible. Um, and so what this means is if you take global usings from C Sharp 9, you take uh, the, the global usings uh, from um, C Sharp 10, this can be the entire web app now. You don't actually have to have any usings. There's no main, there's no nothing. Uh, this makes .NET look a lot more like some of the newer languages like Python um, where or, or Node.js where they would go, wow, you have to write a lot of code to get .NET to do an API. Now you can see a three-line API is uh, possible with the, with the tech. Um, MVC is still part of the system. This is just a different way of doing things for uh, especially learning .NET. Um, cloud development, you know, .NET is amazing for um, interior scalable apps and the new microservice style apps that are coming out before. So if you look at the left side, front end, back end data, the way you run that application is you scale each of those nodes up. You say a bigger database, more memory, a bigger back end with more memory or more CPUs. Uh, so you're kind of limited in the way that you can scale. But if you look on the right side, if you break things up into um, microservices where you have a, a, a middle layer looking at a messaging system, for, for example, uh, now I can take some of these things and I can actually scale them horizontally as well. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. So .NET's created both of these things. I'm super excited to talk about this, which is people always ask, you know, how do you use .NET at Microsoft? First off, we use a lot of .NET at Microsoft. Um, but this is some of the big ones that we're allowed to talk about. Um, Azure Active Directory uh, Gateway. Uh, the app service gateway, this means if you're using app service or you're using AAD, um, all those requests are going through .NET at some point. Bing.com runs on .NET and Dynamics, all traffic going to Dynamics goes through uh, the gateway as well. And the gateway is powered by this tech called YARP. Uh, it stands for yet another reverse proxy. This is an open source project you can go grab yourself. Um, we built this for ourselves because parts of Azure have to run on Windows and parts of Azure run on Linux. And the nice thing about YARP, because it's written in .NET, it runs great on both Linux and Windows. And so when you when you hit a, an app service application in Azure, it's going through YARP. And you can see we're doing 100 billion requests a month uh, with about 7.5 petabytes of data. And what this shows you is .NET is designed to run at massive scale. Um, of course, 
uh, you know, not only do we build .NET, but um, my team builds a lot of Azure as well. And so we have uh, support for .NET 6 across app service, static web apps, and Azure Functions day zero. Uh, and that's our promise moving forward is we'll be in all regions day zero on both Windows and Linux. And so uh, we hit that with .NET 6. Uh, last year we hit it for everything except Functions. This year we got Functions as well. Um, and I'm super excited to talk about, you know, as we talk about microservices, there's a new service we just uh, GA at built the build conference in May. It's called Azure Container Apps, and it's a it's a way of building apps that run on top of Kubernetes, but you don't have to have a Kubernetes cluster or manage Kubernetes. You can just uh, uh, focus on your apps, not all the mechanics behind Kubernetes, but you are actually running on Kubernetes, and you'll be able to upgrade this to, to Kubernetes. And it runs in a ton of open source tech like Envoy, Dapper, Kata, and of course Kubernetes. And you know, not only do we have container apps, but we have first class support in Visual Studio as well. So you can take your ASP.NET Core applications and you can publish them up to container apps, uh, both directly uh, or you can use CI CD. Um, and so that I'm going to do a couple of quick demos uh, of, of, of some cool stuff here. And um, because I, I uh, couldn't make it to the conference, I've got a cold. Um, I have some video here that I'm going to play uh, for some of these demos, so I don't have to speak to them the entire time. But the first thing we're going to talk about is how do you get to, to, to Azure Container Apps in Visual Studio? And we're going to show you doing this, show, show you how to do this using GitHub Actions, which I think is important uh, because I think that's the way that you really want. If you're working with a team, you want your uh, when you decide to push to, to GitHub, an action fires off in your app, updates in your in your test staff. So let me share audio. And let's get going to start off here. This is the podcast app, uh, and this is available to you today. This is a, uh, an application that has a Blazor implementation. It's got a Maui implementation that runs on all the platforms. It's got an ASP.NET Core backend that's designed to scale. Um, and so it's a great example of how to use modern.net to build all the tiers of a modern application. You can grab it right here, github.com slash Microsoft slash .net dash podcasts. And uh, with that, I'm going to have um, Jeremy on the team show you how you would actually publish an app uh, with Visual Studio. The podcast ingestion worker is a service that basically queues up requests for a new podcast so that they can be approved. This service needs to scale in case a lot of requests come in. What I would normally have to do is stand up either multiple machines behind a load balancer or do something like set up a Kubernetes cluster and configure the clusters, the nodes, the pods, all of the services, and basically spend a lot of time on infrastructure that as a developer, I really don't wanna do. I'm gonna show you a new experience that handles this for you. And I'm going to right click on the ingestion worker, choose publish. For my target, I'll pick Azure. And then I'm going to publish to the Azure Container Apps Preview. This will prompt me to set up my environment. And I'm going to basically create everything brand new. So I'm going to give this a unique name. We'll do a new resource group name. We'll call it New Podcast ENV for Environment. We'll even create the backing environment. We'll give this one a ZZZ. And we'll give it a new analytics log workspace. Click OK there. I'm just going to make this name podcast ingestion worker app. Let's click create and see what happens. So it's basically created the infrastructure that I need to deploy to. The next step is to build the image of this worker and deploy it. So we're going to pick that container and we're going to pick a container registry. I'll just go ahead and pick an existing registry for this. And now notice that I have two options. I have publish and CI CD using GitHub Actions workflows. We'll look at this in a second. For now, let's just go ahead and get this published out. And now we are ready to publish. So I'm going to go ahead and click publish. And this will build the background service and deploy it to the Azure Container Apps. And it succeeded and tells us that the Container App 
is ready. Let's take a look at what was created for us. I'm in the portal and this is my resource group and you can see we have our container app, our container app environment, and our log analytics workspace. Everything we need to track this container app. Okay, so you just saw how Jeremy was able to go and take an application and easily do a right click publish. But as I said before, that's not the best way to do this for in a, in a, in a team environment. In a team environment, what you really want is you want to use some form of uh, CI, CD, continuous integration, continuous deployment to do this kind of work for you. And uh, it, to me, it's the preferred kind of way of, of publishing that we're going to do in the future for .NET. And so now uh, we'll take the application and we're going to right click and add CI, CD to it and then show how making a code change uh, will kick off uh, an automatic build in the cloud um, all behind the scenes for you. This is a YAML file that is generated automatically. And what it does is it allows provisioning of your resources to the environment on a commit, which is something you would want to do instead of right click and publish for a continuous integration and continuous deployment. You want that scenario. So let's take a look at what we can do with this. I've got the container app open in the portal and I can go to the endpoint for the ingestion and notice I have these get methods, but I don't have a post method. That's because I haven't enabled ingestion yet. That's a, a flag that we have to configure. So instead of going through the whole process of publishing again, let's see how easy GitHub Actions make this. I'm going to go back into my application, and I'm going to open up my deployment file and go to the section with employment ingestion, and we'll go ahead and change that to true and save that. So of course, that, that gives us the opportunity to commit. So turn on feed ingestion, and I'm gonna go ahead and commit all in sync. Now this has pushed this out. Let's see what's going on at GitHub. What we can see here is an action has been kicked off. This is our podcast API CI CD. So it's running all the various steps for that. It's going to log in, deploy ACR if it's not already there. So this is a non-destructive deployment. It'll build the updates, build the ingestion. And then there's also a deployment step that we can see here where it'll actually deploy the application. Let's give it a few moments and see where it takes us. Now we're deploying to production and our deployment was successful. So we have a full deployment. Let's go ahead and go back to our ingestion. And I'm gonna refresh this Swagger endpoint. Now notice that I have a post for the feeds. So just by making that small change and checking it in, we were able to automatically deploy and update our container app. Uh, you can easily take uh, an application, as I said, you right click, you select CI CD, we, we build that YAML file for you. Um, we we uh, go and put your secret into GitHub. We do all the magic for you behind the scenes. And after that, you get a great running uh, uh, CI CD. Uh, next, I want to talk about what we call fusion development. It's a word I, I, I personally don't don't get, but it's uh, if you Google it, you can see it is a valid word. This is how do you build back ends for low code solutions? Uh, your low code solution could be a back end for, let's say, uh, Power Platform uh, or various other things. And so there's a couple of things here. We've, we've actually worked to make .NET awesome for this. We have uh, the ability for uh, if a Power App calls into a .NET application, uh, we can pass the security token all the way down to the .NET application. It can make calls to like M365 on behalf of the user. We've added support in .NET, so you can actually right click and publish directly to API management. So what happens is, we publish your app to Azure, and after that, we take the swagger from your API, that's the definition of your API, and we automatically put that into API management. Once you do that, you have access to Power Platform. Uh, uh, to get to call APIs, you hook the Power Platform to an API management instance, and it can then see all of your APIs. So we built great support for this kind of development into .NET. We uh, just released this week with the update of Visual Studio um, yesterday, uh, a new feature called port tunneling. And so the challenge of building a power app is the power app doesn't really run on my local machine. It uh, might run on my, could run on my phone. 
and my phone doesn't have access to local local uh, local host on my computer. And so with this new tunneling feature in Visual Studio, you can take any API that you're building locally and you can make it have a public endpoint in the cloud. Um, and this makes uh, power platform development, uh, a, you know, phone development app much, much easier. It's a super, we've been trying to build this feature for five years. I'm super excited about it. Uh, and so what we're going to show now is we're going to show building a power platform application uh, and having it um, hit breakpoints in my local machine as I'm working on it. So here's Brady uh, doing a quick demo of this. So here I have my Power Apps environment. What I'm going to do is I'm going to open up this dev copy. This is the app I'm working on. And what you'll see when I go ahead and run it, it's making a call out to an API. I've right-click deployed this API out, and uh, within Visual Studio, I've got the ability to include an APIM deployment. So I've ingested my API in APIM, and so far it seems like things have been working, but I got a report that there's an error on it. So I want to try to figure out what's wrong. So this delete feature seems to be working, so that will actually delete it. Now I've got six pending, whereas a minute ago I had seven. So now I want to go to a different one that I want to approve. And, oh, yep, looks like we got some kind of an error message. So I'm going to need to figure out what's going on here, see if it's just that issue or if it's all of them. I'll click this one. Yep, looks like I've got some sort of a bug in my API. So I'm going to need to actually debug the API um, with this Power App. Uh, which can be a little bit tricky. So I'll bring over Visual Studio here. And here's my actual uh, feed endpoints uh, extensions, which is really all the different feed endpoints. And the one that I'm going to have to debug is this one, uh, this put, because that's where we're actually updating the user submitted feeds. I'm going to put a breakpoint right here and hit F5 and just kind of see if I can debug it. But it's probably a familiar problem whenever you've got to debug an API that's getting hit from an external you know, client is that whenever the you know you hit a, you hit a five on it you're going to be debugging you know on localhost so it's kind of hard to actually hit it uh from you know something like a power app or something running in the cloud the good thing is we've enabled a new feature uh port tunneling in visual studio and i'll go ahead and create a couple of additional settings in my launch settings file here one is create tunnel i'll set that to true and the second one is to give it a tunnel name and now when i hit f5 when i debug my api uh, rather than debugging it on localhost, we're actually going to open up a public tunnel uh, back to my localhost machine and give myself a public DNS that I could actually drop in any kind of a cloud provider, any client, and hit it. So you can see there's my fully qualified domain name. So notice that even though he's running on his local machine, the URL is no longer localhost. Um, that's the feature. That's what this feature does. Is it? Is it lets you? Um, have a public URL. Uh, that tunnel that I asked for, uh, subtunnels.api.visualstudio.com. Now I'm using APIM, uh, API management, pardon me, in Azure to uh, to uh, deal with my uh, uh, custom connectors and power apps. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to paste this URL, which is now that tunnel back to myself into this API management instance. This is the actual API management instance that I just deployed to from Visual Studio which we're using as a custom connector. And you can see when I hit the uh, get user submitted feeds, it's working uh, just to kind of make sure it's working. I'm going to put a breakpoint right here in that method and I'll go back over again and hit send. And yep, looks like we are uh, now directing traffic from that API. And so you can see from the Azure portal, which is not running on, on Brady's machine, he now gets uh, in, he gets breakpoints when he, when he tests API management. In the front door back to uh, my machine through the new feature of Visual Studio called port tunneling. So now what I'm going to do <clears throat> is open up my Power Apps uh, uh, client here one more time. I'm going to go back into that dev copy of the app that I'm working on. And now you'll see I've got six running here. And I want to go ahead and try and approve one of these with my breakpoint set inside of that uh, put method. And look, oh, there you go. Uh, and I can see, oh, that's what's wrong. So I'm passing two parameters to that find method. It looks like I'm passing ID and cancellation token. Like maybe I copied and pasted those parameters and didn't think about it. I'm going to go ahead and back that out, get rid of that cancellation token, and just pass ID. And I'm just going to hit the debugger again. It's definitely going to stop my power app from running, but that's okay. I'm the only one hitting it. It's my dev copy. So now what I'll do is I'll go back over to my power app again. Um, and that's just my browser opening up that we're running in that tunnel. And since I'm running in the tunnel and the APIM is hitting my machine, I can hit this and we'll tunnel right back to my machine. You can see there's that ID that I just sent. I indeed found that feed and now it looks like things are working. So we're good to go. I was like, it's going to remove that feed from 
that uh, context, and now we're off and running. So now I can go down, I can try another one here, and make sure things are good. Give that one a continue. Try one more with the debugger running, just kind of make sure things are all good. You see here, all right, that looks good. Go ahead and remove this debugger, and I've got a couple of these feeds that have been submitted. I'll go ahead and approve these. Actually, that one. Uh, go ahead and approve this one. Approve that one. And so you can see how uh, using port it makes it very easy to build and debug uh, Power Platform, mobile apps, um, all with .NET with Visual Studio. Um, you know, I mentioned before uh, a couple slides ago. You know, we showed this uh, uh, this uh, pattern. So one of the, one of the aspects of, that makes microservices cool is if your so here, app is developed the right way, you can scale horizontally. So I mentioned before on the end tier application, all you can do is add more hardware. In this case. What I do is I have this this box represents a, a node that I have in Azure running a, um, uh, a container app. And what I want to do is um, I want to be able to add some some state. I'm going to call this a grain, but I, and I'll get to that in a second. And what's what's cool here is what Orleans is. Uh, Orleans is actually a distributed uh, processing uh, library written in .NET. It actually has powered things like Halo and various other things. And what it lets you do is let you create an object on one machine, and that object then exists on all the machines. Uh, so I can basically take the, the one machine that's processing requests, I can then scale it to the right uh, as hard as I want, uh, knowing that if any object is created, if, it, if the next request goes into one of the other ones, uh, the object's still going to be there. Um, so this is stateless objects. You can basically create an object, it goes into state, uh, and what we do is we keep it in memory as much as we can, uh, but if you don't use the object for a long time, it might go to disk. Um, and so it's like, imagine a shopping cart. Uh, you can build a shopping cart and you could scale the, the, the payment system across multiple machines and it would just see the shopping cart on all the machines. So it's great for making distributed systems. Um, it's a great way of building microservices with um, uh, .NET. Um, and you're gonna hear us talk a lot more about this uh, in the future. For example, examples of state we might want is in Blazor Server. We might want your server state to actually be able to move machines via something like this. So with that, what we're going to do is there's a feature in the podcast app called Listen Together where um, I can invite somebody else in uh, to a chat room to basically listen to the podcast together. That's an example of a great piece of tech that can run with, with distributed objects because we're going to go create that room. And no matter which machine is, is it being hit on the back end of the podcast app, uh, they'll all see that, that, that room. So here Brady is going to do another demo and he's going to take uh, that chat room and make it available in the podcast app. So here you'll see the listen together part of the .NET Together podcast. What we're going to do is I want to go into one of my favorite shows. I'm going to click on the listen together uh, icon. I'm going to enter in my name and hit open room. Now what's going to do is it's going to give me a room code. I want to copy that. Another user can take it and go to the together mode, paste in the code. But before we hit the join room button, what we're going to show you is that we've added Orleans to this because it's really great for building these distributed apps and it's really great for doing like backends behind the uh, application where we want to control things uh, with state. Uh, so in this case, I want to control the state of a room. You'll see here that that grain uh, just fired off the join room method twice, uh, one for the user who created it, one for the second. You'll see as I scroll through the uh, track here, you'll see the update player state method's going to get updated as well. Go down here and I'll do the same thing. And there's an update player state method firing off because that grain is actually executing. All right, now I'll click leave room. See that leave room method's going to fire. I'll go over here to discover. And before I do, go back here to grains. I'm going to go to a different show. This time I want to go ahead and click join the room, enter in my name. And we'll see this time when I hit open room. Now we're going to have two grains because I've got two different rooms. I want to hit leave the room. You'll see one goes away because there's nobody in the room. We don't need the grain anymore. And then I actually leave the room again. And there you go. That's a great example of how Orleans uh, grains can persist state in your app. Here's what that looks like. In my program CS, I wrote some custom uh, service wire up in middleware, uh, add Orleans and map Orleans dashboard, which we've added in the Orleans extensions uh, file here in the code. You'll see that all I'm going to do is I'm going to look and get my connection string um, uh, for uh, Azure storage. I'm going to give my Orleans cluster a name and a service name. I'm going to wire up storage as my back. Azure Storage is a backup, so in case the, the objects no longer are in memory anymore, they will go to a storage. It could be a SQL database, it could be Azure Storage, a variety of options, how we manage your distributed data. Store for the state. 
and I configure my endpoints. And then I'm going to turn on the optional dashboard just because I want to be able to see everything going on. Uh, that's the dashboard you saw running here in the background. And that's going to answer at the WAC dashboard endpoint. And here's what my grain looks like. I inherit from grain and I room grain interface. So you've got join room and leave room and set room and update player state. And those really just make calls to the domain objects in the back. We really already use them before. Like I said, I didn't have to change the hub code because we had these request handlers and all I did was I all he had to basically do is basically make his object uh, derived from an interface, which enables the distributed computing aspects. Went in and changed our calls uh, from instead of going directly to the EF uh, front of database. And now I'm actually making a call to get that grain from the grain factory and then calling the grain methods on there. What's cool is I've got this running in my uh, container environment. So you can see here I've got my listen together hub. I want to use VS to go ahead and attach to that process and uh, set, kind of set a breakpoint. And now what I can do is I can just attach to it and set my manage.net core for Unix as the uh, thing I want to attach to. And now when I actually run my code, I can step through it. And that gives me the opportunity to kind of see uh, what my code's going to look like when it's executing inside of that container or inside of a Kubernetes environment. I can actually kind of test it running directly inside the container environment and kind of get a better idea for what's going to happen in production. So there's my uh, incoming username and my connection ID. So I can actually figure out what's going on. So what we've done is we've added Orleans to the uh, podcast sample because we think it's a great feature uh, for distributed dev and uh, one of the features of Orleans. And this is uh, the, the contrib dashboard. So we can kind of get a background view of what's going on in that Orleans cluster. Uh, thanks a lot. Uh, hope this gives you some uh, um, ideas on what you can do for distributed dev with ASP.NET Core in the future. Take care. So I'm super excited about uh, this distributed computing aspect of .NET. It's an area we haven't really moved into in the past, and I'm excited to go in there. Uh, to close out the .NET 6 part of this uh, this thing, before we get into what's coming in .NET 7, um, uh, .NET MAUI, or Multi-Platform App UI. Um, basically, the idea here is basically to basically let you basically three times in a row. Uh, the idea here is we want you to be able to, you know, we had Xamarin, and Xamarin required you to have an iOS app, an Android app, um, we wanted to say there's only a, a, a single project. So you write a single project, and from that project, you can generate WinUI, which is for Windows native, Mac, uh, which runs on Mac Catalyst, iOS, or Android. So your one app can run on all the different platforms. It's a single code base, um, and it uh, uh, is cross-platform native UI. So we don't we don't draw the pixels. We use the UI stacks that are built in those things. And uh, it, it is just now available, uh, the, the uh, Framework is GA'd as a build, um, and the tooling will GA uh, with .NET 7 in November. Um, but the, the framework is fully GA'd. You can build production products on this today. Um, it's got an amazing library called Essentials as well. And this takes uh, many of the, the things that are different on the different devices and makes them the same. So if I call Clipboard, uh, it'll call the right Clipboard API for an iOS device or the right API for Windows or the right API for Android. So these abstract some of the platform things uh, and make your life a lot easier. Okay, with that, uh, James is going to come on and show us uh, some of the cool stuff in the podcast app. Let me introduce you to the .NET podcast application written 100% natively with .NET MAUI across iOS, Android, Mac, and Windows. Here I have the application running on Windows and Android, and it leverages common services all built with .NET, including web APIs, Azure databases, and SignalR that are also shared with the ASP.NET Core and Blazor web apps. Now, the applications are running here natively on each platform. I can use my mouse and scroll wheel or touch controls over here. I can navigate into a show. I can go ahead and subscribe to it. If I want to unsubscribe, we get native prompts on each platform. I can also go into the subscriptions and unsubscribe there too. What's great is that I can also come in and start listening to a podcast. Let me go ahead and pause it here for a second. And what's really neat about this application is that this has a new listen together mode. And what's great is that this enables both iOS, Android, Mac, Windows, and the web version to create rooms that can be shared and listen to podcasts together. So let me go ahead and type in my name, James, and open the room. And now what I can do is take this code and put it over into my Android application. I'll join the room. I'll say Android over here and join the room. Instantaneously, you can see that Android has joined James, and now we can start listening to the podcast together on each platform, including skipping through and also sending emojis 
across based on how we think the podcast is going. Now, this is really cool because it shares nearly 100% of code, but still offers native playback on iOS, Android, Mac, and Windows. Let's take a look at the application and how it was built. Over here, I have the podcast application solution with one single project with our entire source code in it, including all of our converters, models, pages written with XAML, platform helpers, view models, and shared views. All of my code is in this single project, which makes it an absolute delight to debug and code against. What's great here is that the CS Proj has common functionality for all my applications, including application title, the identifier, version information, and additionally, the minimum and maximum supported information here. We can also see that .NET MAUI has very powerful features, including cross-platform images, splash screens, and icons. So here from the source code, we can go ahead and configure our icon, our splash screen, and automatically, if we dive into the resource folders and images, you can see we have a healthy blend of SVGs and PNGs. When you start up the application and compile it, .NET MAUI will automatically compile and optimize those SVGs and PNGs for you automatically. You can also put raw assets as well as other things, such as ResX files and your XAML styling in there. Now, it's really nice that you can also take advantage of the vast ecosystem of NuGets. Here, we're using Monkey Cache and MVVM helpers to be a little bit more productive when developing this application. Now, what I love is that there's a common startup in the application registering not only Don and Maui, but also Blazor, which I'll talk about here in a second, essential APIs to access native features, services, pages, and so much more. It even enables me to configure my cross-platform fonts that are handled automatically with .NET MAUI. Now, one thing I want to show you is that this is the XAML that you know and love coming from Xamarin Forms, WPF, or UWP with common data bindings as well. So if we go into the Discover page, which is the main page, we have some commonalities with Xamarin Forms, but additionally, some really new powerful features. So we have brand new .NET MAUI namespaces, and we have some things that we know and love, such as a powerful collection view, item templates, group headers. And here is this player control. Now, this is a composable control that's used on multiple pages of the application. Now, what's neat about the player control is that it actually taps into native capabilities. If I go into the platform folders, we'll see under Windows, iOS, and Android that each of them have audio services. Here, this is where you can go ahead and access native functionality. Here we can toggle into iOS. So we can see here's our iOS functionality. If I go into my services for Android and look at my media player services here, we can see that I have all of my Android namespaces available to me. You still get the power of the underlying platform, but with all of the great capabilities of building native cross-platform applications from a single code base. And additionally, with .NET MAUI, you can create hybrid applications. I said that this application shared common backend services with the Blazor application, but it also shares some UI components. If we open up the pages and the listen together page, we can see that this is actually using a Blazor web view. In fact, if we take a look up top, it's reusing all of the listen together capability. This is one of the coolest aspects of Maui is you can actually embed a Blazor control or a Blazor application inside of your Maui app. So you can build electron style applications where you're using web tech inside of a native native application. The web tech and then because it's inside of a native application has access to the full platform. Abilities that are shared directly in the Blazor application. This enables us to be hyper-productive using Visual Studio, IntelliSense, Hot Reload, and so much more to target all of our different platforms. And that's .NET MAUI, enabling you to build beautiful native cross-platform apps across iOS, Android, Mac, and Windows. We're excited about being able to build native apps again across all the platforms. You might ask about, you know, what about web? You know, we have this uh, rich set of uh, features inside of, of ASP.NET. We have Blazor. Um, if you want to have a PWA that has the most reach, uh, we have Blazor plus Maui. That's where you take your web application, but you run it in a native application, kind of electron style, hybrid. Um, and then we have, you know, support for full native with Maui when forms into WPF uh, on, the, on the direct platforms. We have two forms of Blazor. 
uh, Blazor Server, which is my, my favorite version. It's one of the lightest weight um, SPA applications you can ever build because we don't send a lot of JavaScript down. Uh, we just have a single R service and we have a small JavaScript that when an action happens, we send a request back, we build the page on the server again and just send the diff back super fast. We have WebAssembly uh, that lets you build full native applications that run inside the browser uh, using WebAssembly. So we're running your C Sharp in the browser. Uh, it means that there's no server required. Um, it can be a static website with, with no real functionality and the apps can uh, run, run uh, completely offline. So, you know, you've got a lot of choices here. I'm gonna skip through this a little bit. Um, um, I was going to say there is there is stuff that we've done in, in in six that's really good here in WebAssembly as well. You can now build native applications. So it used to be that we would always interpret the .NET code. Now we have a feature where you can actually enable it, where we uh, um, pre-compile that. We call that ahead of the time, ahead of time compile that code, uh, which gives you much faster performance inside of uh, a Blazor WebAssembly application in .NET seven. I hope we'll give you more control over how much of it to make native because native makes it bigger. So. But uh, we have great solutions for web. Um, and so with that, I want to talk a little bit about .NET 7. And I'm just going to show some concepts and some ideas. Some of this stuff is shipping in Preview 5 uh, this week. Um, but we have a couple of goals, which is app modernization, uh, cloud native development, and uh, you know, finish that Maui experience, take it even, even further. Um, and uh, I'm going to probably not do this demo, but one of the things we have is we know there's still plenty of customers. There's still millions of customers that are building .NET framework applications. Um, and how do you take a web application .NET framework and, and migrate it? Um, so we have a new feature where you'll be able to basically um, have a ASP.NET core application that sits in front of your web form application, your ASP.NET framework application. And you can basically migrate your application uh, page by page. What happens is if the page exists in the .NET Core application, the .NET Core application uh, will, will handle the page. If the .NET Core cannot, application cannot find a, a page that has that, that's, that, uh, that can handle that request, it sends it to the .NET Framework application. So it lets you slowly, one by one, migrate page by page your application. Um, and we do um, handle state sharing for you as well. So we do, we do know that the, the two applications have to be able to write to the same state store. Uh, because you're running two web apps, they need to have a, a couple of things. You can, so you can see here, we can do bytes, strings, and ints, um, but we have objects coming as well uh, before we uh, GA.NET 7. So I'm just gonna that. And uh, we can come back to that if we have time at the end. Um, you know, we talked about microservices and containers and stuff like that. Containers are becoming the, 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 the way to deploy to the cloud. Um, they let you basically build VMs in a in a very small manner that are that are very uh, you know you don't have to go build a huge operating system and then go install stuff on it. You use a text file that describes that. Um, um, but today we think it requires too many uh, things to be on your machine, and so uh, what we plan to do is have a mechanism where you can build directly to a container. You don't have to have Docker for desktop. You don't have to do any of that. You don't have to have Docker files. We can just take your app and make it in directly into a container. And so with this, I'm going to do a quick preview of what we uh, think we could do. This is a demonstration of a proof of concept to help you get to Azure container related services and registries as fast and friction free as possible using Visual Studio. First, let me show you the current state today. I have a ASP.NET uh, web API here and I want to get it to Azure container apps, Azure container registry or app service with containers. In Visual Studio, you would do that uh, using publish. And so I'm going ahead and go ahead and say, I want to go to get to Azure, choose I want to get this to my container registry. We have great Azure tooling to allow you to uh, create uh, Azure resources and provision new ones. I happen to have an existing one here, which I'm going to go ahead and select. Awesome. Visual Studio has helped me configure that. Everything looks good. I'm going to click publish. And looks like I cannot actually get to uh, Azure Container Registry because it's asking me that you need Docker. That's right. I've heard of this Docker thing. I've been told I need to add it to my uh, application. So great. Visual Studio says, hey, great, awesome. Add Docker support. Uh, sure, I want Linux. Awesome, I have this now new file that maybe I'm not familiar with as a concept as a developer because I don't usually work in containers. I'm just trying to get my app to containers. Uh, but that's fine. Everything looks good. I'm now going to click publish. Still can't do it. And the real reason is, is because uh, it's telling me exactly here. You need this thing called Docker Desktop. And when I go to that URL, it's going to take me here and saying, you need this, all these tools, 
uh, I need this thing. How do I download it? It's going to ask me to reboot a couple times. Uh, not a great process. So fast forward, let me go ahead and delete this and let me show you what we're trying to do to make that process as smooth as possible. And that process actually added a couple artifacts to our concept. So let me go ahead and clean those up and remove those profiles and show you that we don't need any of these in order to get to Azure Container Services. So I'm going to go through the same process again and make one change and show you how simple uh, it's going to be, uh, hopefully, in the future. Uh, please keep in mind this is a proof of concept, so there are some rough edges. Um, but let's go ahead and do that flow again. So again, I want Azure, I want Azure Container Registry, and I want to select my existing registry. So I'll click Finish. Same aspect here. Now, uh, just as an implementation detail, we hope that you would not have to do this or we'll make an option for it. But now I want to say I want to use implicit container uh, support and I'm just set that to true. And again, we will smooth this over in the tooling experience, but inevitably that's the option that I'm going to choose. If you remember, I clicked publish before and I had a couple warnings and I had to do it a couple extra steps just to get my container as fast as possible to Azure. Now I'm just going to click Publish, and you can see we're already processing. Uh, so we've eliminated a, a couple steps, making it as fast as possible to get there. And the .NET SDK now is taking the responsibility of pushing this. And very quickly, I got my app to Azure Container Registry, which now I can use in an Azure Container app or app service uh, extremely quickly. We can go to the registry here, and you can see that I had nothing there before. Let's click Refresh, and here's the latest that we just pushed um, right here um, with all the information and all the different layering that goes along within containers. So we hopefully removing some steps for you to understand. Now, because this is a part of the .NET SDK, um, you would be able to also do this from uh, the CLI. Now I'm using the publish profile capability in .NET Publish in this proof of concept to be able to just say, hey, .NET Publish and use all this information, which is all contains all the same information that we have in this publish profile defining the Azure registry I want to get to and some authentication type information. Uh, now I can also use this in my CI builds. And so having a great Visual Studio experience, but also a, a SDK level CLI experience to help you do the same thing as quickly as possible um, using your, C your CLI and in your CI tools without additional uh, SDKs or tools. And you can see I've gone and done that uh, very quickly. And if we go back and refresh, uh, we can see the latest here, and we can see that's the, the latest update was just uh, one minute later there. So thanks for watching the video, and we hope to get your feedback on this experience. Thank you. Yes, I'm super excited about that experience. Uh, um, you know, as I said, I think containers are going to be the, the way that we deploy to the, to the cloud in the future. Um, and you shouldn't have to know about containers to do that. So uh, Tim was just showing you how you could easily uh, take a an nap and and uh, make a container without even having any of those tools or Hyper-V or any of that stuff installed. Um, the thing I'm going to show you next is um, uh, basically security support, AD support uh, associated with minimal APIs. So with .NET 6, we introduced minimal APIs. That thing I showed earlier, three lines of code, you're building a running web application. Well, how do you add full authentication and authorization to that? Um, and so we really want to make this uh, as simple as possible. Our, our goal, that's our, that's our goal, is to make you productive. Um, and so you can see here, promote off to top level uh, in our new builder, add off the middleware to the pipeline by default, um, and then that allows uh, simple auth requirements uh, via metadata on your APIs. And uh, so this is what it looks like today if you want to do some authorization in a web application. And you can notice here, I've got to add a bunch of stuff here. Um, this is a, a minimal API, um, but look at all that stuff at the top. That's, you know, that's, I don't want to make you have to do that. This is what this will look like today. Um, notice now that I just say builder.authentication.add JWT bear. Um, that basically hooks up all that stuff you saw before. And with that, all I've got to do is add a dot require uh, authorization uh, or uh, require uh, with with my claim. So it's it's super super simple, uh, and this is in preview five that just came out this week. Um, then I want to show a crazy cutting edge idea uh, that that we've we've thrown together as well. And this is you know I talked about WebAssembly for Blazor applications. It lets you run .NET C sharp runs in the browser. 
Well, WebAssembly might have other other great implementations uh, that we could use as well. So when we think of the cloud, I have to compile for 32-bit or 64-bit or ARM. Um, I don't know if I'm going to be running on a huge mainframe or I'm going to be running on a PC uh, in, a, in a rack or I'm going to be running on some Raspberry Pi on the edge. And uh, one, one idea here is you could use WebAssembly as your deployment uh, to enable uh, you to put .NET anywhere. Because uh, your app doesn't have to have .NET because it's going to be compiled into the application. Uh, it's compiled to WebAssembly, which runs on all those those architectures. And so with that, um, we're going to show uh, uh, a couple things. I'm going to skip and show this one first. Uh, and so this is, let's do WebAssembly on the server. We're going to take an ASP.NET application um, and show you how you could run that inside of WebAssembly, uh, kind of putting you in, into that same container uh, that you do, do that security you go with containers. Um, we're going to show how you take a console application and go run it in the in the browser. Um, so with that, here's Jeremy showing uh, a little bit of this. If I have time, I'll go back into the the other demo as well. But uh, this is a cool demo. Let's look at an exciting new experiment for .NET. This is a .NET project. It's a console application. You can see .NET seven. And the program itself, very straightforward, gives the current time and tells you which OS architecture it's running on. Let's go ahead and run this. And as expected, okay. what I'm we actually, get... I didn't know that I was actually perhaps running late. I'll, I'll skip the demo. I just want to say thank you. My session is supposed to be over. Um, there's a lot of amazing stuff in .NET 6. Go try it today. Um, and as well, uh, there's a bunch of cool stuff coming in .NET 7. Um, I'm really excited about the so, uh Thank you for using .NET. Thank you for having me, and uh, super excited about um, you know all the tech uh, at, at the conference. I I hope next year I can be in person again. Uh, but thanks for having me.